Over the years, Dungeons & Dragons novels have served a huge role in getting people introduced to D&D lore. R.A. Salvatore's books, for example, helped Forgotten Realms become the default D&D setting in 5th edition. But back in the early 80s, D&D was venturing into the world of literature for the first time, and D&D's publisher wanted to make a huge impact. At first, the premise started with one novel, but the idea expanded into an epic narrative with the trilogy format. Then, the premise quickly grew beyond books into an entire franchise. D&D adventure modules were made to tie into these novels, and players were given the option to play through the epic narrative themselves. This changed the face of D&D forever, for better and for worse. Welcome to Dragonlands. Hello, and welcome to DM It All, a show where we talk about D&D books and tabletop gaming history. The impact of the Dragonlands books have been somewhat forgotten over the years, but it was at one point one of the most popular D&D settings. The original Chronicles trilogy sold over 3 million copies by 1998, and several books out of the 150-ish novels that followed became New York Times bestsellers. Not only that, but the Dragonlance series was one of the earliest examples of D&D being pushed as a franchise. It eventually expanded out into miniatures, board games, comic books, video games, and an animated movie. The series has even been adapted into a Russian musical, and bands like Nightwish have made songs based on the novels. A lot of these fan songs focused on the wizard Raistlin, the breakout character of the series. Raistlin served as a kind of proto-Anakin Skywalker, with his own descent into the dark side. Unsurprisingly, a lot of D&D fans identified with this pasty cynical nerd, as he stood out amongst the other, more traditionally heroic protagonists. The Dragonlance universe was created by Tracy and Laura Hickman, a husband and wife couple that started their D&D careers by privately publishing their own adventures, Rahasia and Pharaoh. After being driven into bankruptcy through a bad business deal, they tried selling their books to TSR in 1981. TSR not only published the books, but they also hired Tracy so he could create more adventures for them. The Pharaoh module formed the beloved Desert of Desolation series, and the couple would also go on to create the famous Ravenloft setting. The Hickmans are often considered the best adventure designers from the TSR era of D&D. Dragonlance was originally cooked up by the couple during the long car ride from their former home in Utah to TSR headquarters in Wisconsin. They discussed two ideas they had been batting around for several years. One was to use an entire world to support a central storyline rather than various smaller adventures. The other was to have a world dominated by dragons. So the two concepts were merged, and the central plotline would revolve around the War of the Lance, a conflict started by an evil goddess named Tachesis, seeking to conquer the world. This multi-headed dragon goddess may look like the dragon god Tiamat, but she's completely different, trust us! <laughs> In the story, Tachesis has corrupted dragons throughout the land, and the heroes have to find the legendary dragon lance to slay these evil creatures. TSR responded well to these ideas because survey results at the time showed that players wanted more dragons in their Dungeons & Dragons games. Apparently, there was a criminal dragon deficit at the time, but the winged lizards would now be featured as the main opponents in the series, with each module focusing on a different chromatic dragon. Margaret Weiss was hired as a book editor for TSR in 1983, and one of her first assignments was as editor to Project Overlord which would later be retitled Dragonlance. The plan was not only to write a Dungeons & Dragons novel, but to supplement it with a trilogy of related modules. Tracy Hickman was originally a design coordinator for the series, but he and Weiss ended up becoming the main authors of the franchise. According to Weiss, TSR hired a popular mainstream author to pen the books, but the publisher was unhappy with the results from this unnamed writer. So Hickman and Weiss took on the main writing duties instead. The two of them would become regular collaborators even outside of the Dragonlance books. Dragons of Autumn Twilight was the first of the Chronicles trilogy, which technically makes this book Dungeons and Dragons, colon, Dragonlance, colon, Chronicles, colon, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. 
The events of this book was split in half between two modules. We'll be covering the first module in this video, while the second module will be covered in a follow-up video. We should note that the book itself still holds up in a lot of ways. It's easy to read, fast-paced, and has many great moments. The main characters are distinctive and each have their own unique voices too. All of that being said though, it is very typical of high fantasy literature. The plot of Autumn Twilight is basically a variation on the Fellowship of the Ring, since it's about an overly large party guarding MacGuffins while being hounded by villains that are gearing up for war. The collector's edition for Dragonlance Chronicles even pitches the series by saying it will quote, satisfy the old demands for something to read after the Ring books. Keep in mind that Tolkien-esque fantasy as a whole wasn't as ever-present and cliché back then as it is now. In fact, it was D&D and its influence on RPGs in general that helped make the genre become so ubiquitous. Despite these similarities, there is an important aspect to the world that diverges from both Lord of the Rings and D&D. Dragonlance has no halflings. The D&D halfling race was always a blatant ripoff of the hobbits. They were even originally called hobbits before Tolkien's estate asserted their copyright. An interesting thing to note is that the first module was created before the books, so it dictated the events to occur in Autumn Twilight. This process was reversed with the second novel, but the initial module determined a lot of important things about the universe. That includes the characters, since the main Dragonlance cast was cooked up during the playtest sessions for this adventure. Harold Johnson was one of the players involved with the playtest, and his original character was not only a halfling, but a halfling with a ring of invisibility. Hmm. Johnson's character made everyone afraid that they were pushing their luck, so halflings were replaced by a new group called the Kender. Kender are basically children who never grew up, not just in appearance, but also their childlike enthusiasm and curiosity. They're also kleptomaniacs, and are so annoying that the taunt ability is a racial trait for them. Another difference is the initial absence of dragons and clerics. Dragons are considered myths in this setting, and there are no true clerics, as the adventure calls them. Clerics that aren't true clerics believe instead in false gods. It's kind of weird that dragons are myths at the start of this, considering the series was supposed to boost the D&D dragon count, but both the dragon and the cleric situation change pretty early on in the book. The setup for the novel is that in the land of Kryn, the party is trying to find a true cleric to confirm whether the gods have left or not. The inhabitants of this land have abandoned worship of the old, i.e. true, gods in favor of fake hippy-dippy gods that are easier to worship. So anyone calling themselves clerics in the world at large are clerics without magic, aka strictly worse fighters. It's also worth noting that gold is useless in this setting because times are dangerous and gold can't be used to make weapons. Instead, each location uses a different form of currency because keeping track of coins wasn't annoying enough already. With the background now established, let's finally get into how the module illustrates the plot of the novel. As usual, spoiler warnings for those interested in playing these adventures, but also spoiler warning for the novels too, since they touch on very similar events. Jump ahead to the time shown here to skip to our spoiler-free final thoughts. The two modules we will be covering are Dragons of Despair and Dragons of Flame. Again, these modules make up the events of the first book, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. We don't know why neither of them share the name of the first book they're based on, but almost all the modules in the series follow this naming convention, with each of them being a dragon of blank. Dragons of Despair likely refers to the Age of Despair, a term used for the current godless Age of Kryn. Likewise, Dragons of Flame likely refers to the amount of destruction present in that module. First, we'll discuss the former, written by Tracy Hickman himself. Dragons of Despair gives the stats for the novel's protagonists, and even recommends the players start with them as their player characters. These pre-generated heroes do have amazing stats, but they also serve to increase the railroading. We'll get into more detail about that in part 2, but speaking on a fundamental level, it's kind of lame to skip out on the character creation and development process of D&D. 
We mentioned railroading in our Dungeonland review, a term used to describe when players have low input on the story and are funneled from one place to the next, but it is perhaps best associated with Dragonlands. Before Dragonlands, most adventures were just sandbox dungeon crawls. If there was a plot, it was usually simplistic. A lot of them were about towns with monster caves nearby. This was because these modules were meant to detail locations rather than set up pre-written plots and events. It was up to the players and the gameplay to create any twists and turns in the story. Dragonlance pushed for adventures to be more akin to what we are used to nowadays, but they also made railroading a far more common issue as well. Usually, plot moments in railroady adventures are tied to the locations, and players have no option but to visit those locations. Dragons of Despair uses keyed off events rather than locations for the early stages, which is an interesting way to avoid players just going from point A to point B. A lot of modern RPGs like Dungeon World use similar concepts, since it makes sense for neglected events to eventually haunt the party. In this case, the more the party ignores the invading army of Draconians, the more likely it is that the army will impact their lives. Draconians are dragon-like humanoids that are new to the land of Kryn. They are basically the replacement for the Lord of the Rings' orcs, and they serve as footmen for the dragon army. Draconians are born from good dragon eggs that were corrupted by Tachesis and her evil dragons. Like regular dragons, different colored draconians are tougher depending on their color. The main enemies here are the Ba's draconians, which are based on the weaker brass dragons. The only thing special about these particular draconians is the fact that they turn to stone upon death, meaning the heroes can get their weapons stuck inside of them. If the players ignore the main plot, the Draconians will eventually take over the entire map and start attacking in endless waves. To stop the Draconian forces, the party will have to find the key item the Dragon Army is seeking in this area, a blue crystal staff. The first event opens the adventure with the party encountering hobgoblins that seek the staff. These hobgoblins are servants of the Dragon Army, and their leader is Fumaster Toad. More on him later. Sure, the party could kill him here, but he'll be back. After fighting the Hobgoblins, the Dungeon Master will roll a die to learn how many encounters should occur before the next event begins. The party will afterwards meet the current owner of the staff in the next two events. The staff bearer is a barbarian woman named Gold Moon, and the party catches her playing music on her lyre. She's accompanied by her lover, a barbarian named Riverwind. In this event, Gold Moon will accidentally drop the staff, and it will heal someone in the party. The party can choose to ignore this miracle, but it's pretty obvious that Goldmoon is the cleric they're looking for, and that she's holding the staff that the Draconians want. If the party choose Goldmoon as a pre-generated character, she'll be unable to participate in the story until this point. But if no player wants to use Goldmoon, she'll be played by the DM, and we all know how fun it is for the plot to center on a DM's character. The party will learn that her lover, Riverwind, got the staff after going insane while on a mission for the Kyushu tribe. He was sent out to prove the ancient gods still existed, and just came back one day with the staff. The chieftain, Goldmoon's father, accused Riverwind of being a fraud. Riverwind and Goldmoon then used the magic of the staff to escape a stoning from the tribe. Honestly, if we were to make an improvement to this module, it would be to remove Goldmoon and Riverwind entirely. Riverwind's backstory could just become the backstory of one of the party members, or perhaps even the party as a whole. One day they blacked out and then woke up with the staff in hand. The party even starts off on a quest similar to Riverwind's, so it's a pretty natural fit. Waking up with a mysterious healing staff would probably be a better introduction to the story than a random hobgoblin fight too. The party will have to gather information regardless of what happens, since the two barbarians don't know much about the staff. In fact, the start of this module is somewhat aimless in general, since the party has no idea what to do at all until they first meet Goldmoon. Once the party has the staff, though, they can head to the nearby tree city of Solace to ask questions. The old storyteller of the village will tell the party to go directly to Zak Saroth, the main dungeon of this adventure. If the party heeds his words, they can actually skip most of the events from the first half of this module. The aimless start and the ability to skip right to the dungeon makes this experience feel more like the older sandbox modules than one would expect. Other clues that the party can pick up in Solace are the rumors of a mysterious white stag appearing in the woods nearby. If the party seeks out this stag, the creature will start leading them towards Darkenwood. It cannot be captured, and it will just keep running ahead. The party can kill the stag, 
but then they'll get cursed by the gods for one week and take penalties to their armor. That's because the creature is actually a messenger from the gods being used to direct the party. Darkenwood is the typical mysterious and spooky forest common in fantasy settings. The tree line here is so thick that no light enters the area, and no one who leaves can ever describe what they experience there. The party will meet a bunch of ghosts almost immediately upon setting foot in the wood. These are not literal D&D ghosts, but creatures called spectral minions. They're much less scary in terms of stats. The minions can't even do damage to the party if they're not carrying weapons, and only half of them are likely to be armed. The party can avoid conflict altogether by showing off the blue crystal staff, and then they'll be escorted to the Forest Master. The Forest Master is a literal unicorn with centaurs and dryads as servants. He'll talk about how a mysterious powerful being came to the woods and foretold of the party's arrival. This is probably referring to the god Paladine, the noble knightly deity who takes an active role in the Dragonlance universe. The stag is specifically his messenger. This mysterious being also told the Forest Master that the party must go to Zaxaroth to get, quote, the greatest gift in the world. As a reward for bothering with this side quest, the unicorn does offer Pegasi to the party. The Pegasi then fly off to the main dungeon to spare them days of travel time. A different clue that can be picked up in Solace is that the capital of Haven is also looking for the crystal blue staff. If the party decides to head to the capital, they'll see that it is swarming with refugees. These people are all trying to escape the dragon armies to the north, and no other place is safe anymore. The players can bypass the chaotic and occasionally violent crowds by telling the guards that they have the staff. The guards will then take them via horseback to the Council of High Seekers. The High Seekers are the new religious leaders preaching the word of the false gods, and they're in charge of the city now. The story goes that the Dragon Army has sworn to the High Seekers not to invade their lands only if the staff is brought to Zaxaroth. The Dragon Army claims the staff was stolen from its proper resting place in that dungeon, and the Draconians want it back. The High Seekers will try to take the staff themselves, but the blue crystal staff zaps any counselor trying to touch it. The counselors will then call it evil and demand the party go to Zaxaroth to get rid of it. So, inevitably, the party has to head to the dungeon. Only a specific portion of Kryn is covered on the module's world map, so there are hard limits on adventuring. Going too far north on the map will have the party enter the conquered Dragonlands, with the endless dragon army prowling about. To the south are the Qualinasti Elflands, and the elves have met the same mysterious prophet that the Forest Master encountered. They'll try to take the party hostage and escort them to the Forest Master. The party can always violently resist this effort, but then the elf lands become hostile territory, and the elves have their own endless armies. Near Zaxaroth, the player will find the barbarian villages, including the one that Goldmoon was part of, the Kyushu. Unfortunately for Goldmoon, the village has been destroyed. In the village ruins, the party will find a group of dead hobgoblins and a message from Lord Verminard. Verminard is a cleric of Tachesis and serves as the main antagonist of the first novel. The message he leaves with the dead hobgoblins is a warning for anyone in his army who tries to take prisoners. Kill or be killed. Certainly not a bad way to set up a villain. Eventually, the party will reach the Zaxaroth area map, but they'll have to cross the swamplands before they can reach the dungeon proper. Several encounters in the book appear in this module, but there are ways to avoid them. One example is the swamp ambush from the novel. If the party uses the makeshift bridges to cross the swamp, they can get ambushed and captured here by the Draconians. But the party can choose to avoid the bridges instead. They'll have to contend with the creatures down in the water, but at least they won't get surprised by the Draconians. We should also note that the Bozok Draconians appear for the first time in this swampy area. These are the spellcasters of the Dragon Army, and when killed, unlike turning to stone like their Ba's cousins, they instead explode. When the party reaches the actual ruins of Zaxaroth, they'll finally reach the cool 3D maps of this module. This style of map was popular at the time and appeared in other modules like Ravenloft. They were the first real attempt to make dungeon maps look a bit prettier than just overhead ink drawings on graph paper, and they can detail multiple stories of a dungeon on a single page as well. 
In the ruins, the party should immediately enter the only building still standing, the Temple of Mishikal. Mishikal is the ancient goddess of healing, and that fact alone should let the party know she will be important in their cleric quest. The reason why the party should enter the temple as soon as possible is because milling around too much in old dungeons usually leads to random encounters. If that sounds like a decent way to get XP, remember, it's not. Random encounters served as a way to punish players back then, since they barely give any experience points or loot. And here, one of the random encounters turns out to be the dungeon's final boss, a black dragon. The plaza outside the Temple of Mishikal is referred to as the Plaza of Death, and the name is fitting because there's a scripted dragon encounter here if the party hangs out for too long. The black dragon will fly out of a nearby well and initiate a fight detailed on the module's cover. Except, the dragon on the cover is fighting more fair than the actual dragon in the module will. You see, in old school D&D, dragons weren't dumb enough to hang around on ground level, just so the party could have a fair shot at hitting them. Instead, they usually flew out of range and proceeded to bombard the party at long distance with spells and dragon breath. That might seem unfair, but old school D&D often wasn't concerned with being fair. Dragons were supposed to be spooky. So spooky that when flying, they actually generate fear auras that weaken their foes and make them flee in terror. Though this dragon will also flee pretty quickly after bombarding the party, it's better overall if the heroes avoid this fight and meet the dragon under more favorable circumstances. Inside the temple of Mishikal, the party will see Mishikal's statue. This was the original resting place of the Blue Crystal Staff, and it's here that Riverwind found it during his stupor. If the party brings the staff to the statue, it will come to life and tell the heroes about their true quest. They need to find the Discs of Mishikal, the new MacGuffin to replace the Staff MacGuffin. These circular discs contain Mishikal's teachings and allow the party to call upon Mishikal's power. After bequeathing this information, the statue will return to normal, and the party will have to venture deeper into the dungeon. Zaxaroth itself is a former capital city that was brought to ruin during the Cataclysm, the big event that made the gods leave Kryn. What essentially happened was that the people of Kryn demanded godlike powers, and the gods responded by destroying their cities. Before the Draconians took over, Zaxaroth's ruins were occupied by the scavenging Aghar, aka Gully Dwarves. Gully dwarves are filthy, smelly, and stupid dwarves that everyone, even regular dwarves, are prejudiced against. The module even calls them an amoral, disgusting race. The gully dwarves still hang around the ruins, but now they work for the draconians as servants. The dwarves usually grovel and run away at the sight of the party, but they have useful information if they can be persuaded to help. You see, the structure of Zaxaroth has slid into a deep ravine and the party will need to find a path to the cavern city down below. One way for the heroes to do that is to use the weird makeshift elevator invented by the gully dwarves. Basically, there are two giant chamber pots attached to a chain pulley system. Gully dwarves fill one chamber pot in order to weigh it down and pull the other pot up. This is how the draconians travel back and forth to the surface, and it seems to be the main reason they keep the gully dwarves around. It's a dangerous machine to use because it is a long drop and the pots can only take two regular sized people before they start falling too fast. Draconians have wings they can use to glide, so any fight that happens on these elevators puts the party at a huge disadvantage. Unfortunately, the other option is to go down the sewers of all places. The party will find a long and super narrow tunnel angled downwards at a steep incline. The walls here are extremely slippery too, so it's likely someone will slide down the entire length of the tunnel. Thankfully, their fall will be broken by some gully dwarves trying to climb their way back up. The slipping party member and the dwarves won't take any damage, though the dwarves won't appreciate the surprise entrance of their guest. As the party makes their way through Zaxaroth, they'll probably meet the ghosts of long-dead city inhabitants. Most of these ghosts are harmless and go about their day as if they were living their ordinary lives from long ago. These ghosts aren't in the novels. In fact, the book protagonists largely skip over most of Zaxaroth by working with the Gully Dwarves, so details like these might be interesting to read for fans of the novels. Zaxaroth as a whole is worth the price of admission, and might make the module worth it even for people not interested in the adventure path. The Hickmans were known for their stellar dungeons, and this is no exception. The ruins of a city sliding down a cliff is a fairly unique premise for a dungeon, and Tracy Hickman fleshes it out with ruined libraries, bakeries, and temples. The main goal of the party is to reach the Dragon's Lair, 
but there are multiple routes the party can take. One option is to ask some of the ghosts walking around, since one of them knows the location of the discs. Another route involves saving two captured members of Goldmoon's tribe. These Kyushu barbarians are located deep within the dungeon, and can join the party if rescued, and one of them knows the location of the Dragon Slayer. It's worth noting these characters aren't in the novels at all, and they aren't the only original characters that the party can recruit in this module either. The other path to victory is through the home of the Gully Dwarves. Here, the party will get a chance of experiencing Gully Dwarf food, and they'll receive it by the fistful, in fact, as the dwarves in the mess hall have frequent food fights and are likely to toss their stew at a party member. The stew is basically made from the gully dwarves putting anything dead or near dead into a pot. This stuff smells so bad that party members will have to make constitution saves to be able to stand next to anyone hit by the inedible goop. The leader of the gully dwarves is <clears throat> Fudge Highbulb. Highbulb's quarters are covered with garish cloths of every color because gully dwarves are similar to 90s internet website creators in terms of design skills. Highbulb has no love for the Draconians because he's no longer the man in charge, and funnily enough, he also hates how much the Draconians have cleaned the place up, so he'll be willing to work with the party to defeat the dragon. This is actually the best route the party can take, since Highbulb has a shortcut that leads directly to the final area. All it requires is the party to shuffle through another narrow and disgusting sewer tunnel. Still, the sewers are a better option than the direct route. Not only does the direct path involve fighting more draconians, but there's also a trap outside of the dragon's quarters that will trigger a loud gong. If the trap goes off, the dragon will poke its head out and immerse the party in acid with its acidic dragon breath. Like in the book, a party member can strike the dragon with the blue crystal staff to insta-kill it. The person that used the staff will then disappear as the staff explodes. The party will then have to escape to the Temple of Mishkal as the Zaxaroth Cavern crumbles around them. A voice will tell the party to grab the discs located in the dragon's treasure stash before the whole place becomes flooded and buried in rock. And the party should really do that since the discs are mandatory for winning the adventure. The adventure ends with the party finding the vanished character lying next to the statue of Mishkal. Like Goldmoon in the story, that party member will now have Mishikal's medallion to convince non-believers that the gods are back. Any clerics in the party will get duplicates of the medallion, and they will finally have access to spells. The party will probably feel victorious as they exit the dungeon, until they notice large plumes of smoke rising from the town of Solace. Overall, Dragons of Despair is a pretty good module. As a story-driven adventure, it really shows off the Hickmans' ability to craft compelling narratives. Even though it's not technically a sandbox adventure, this module still has a lot of flexibility in how the party can tackle it. Those familiar with the books will notice that many moments don't quite mirror the novels exactly, and the party can skip events entirely, depending on the paths they take. Players are not even barred from killing important NPCs, and they can lock themselves out of regions this way by angering the local populace. Of course, there are still some improvements that could have been made, but overall this feels more like a sandbox module than one would expect. And if dungeon masters want to change details around, most elements outside of the plot MacGuffins are not mandatory at all. Most of them don't even get a second mention outside of their introduction, so it's up to the party how important they become. As a whole, players have a lot of wiggle room to leave their mark and craft their own version of the narrative. Sadly, we can't give any of these praises to the sequel, Dragons of Flame. In the meantime, if you want to see us play through the video game adaptation of this module, come check out our other channel, RPG Crits. Remember to like and subscribe if you like our content, and thanks for watching. We'll see you all next session. You know, what sucks is this little man is not just beating me, he's beating all the other characters to death. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't stop him. I really like how he, like, saunters over. <laughs> I can't do anything to him!
<laughs> like, he seems very oh God, ornery and slow and mad. Oh, he kicks too. <laughs> He's kicking his gens. <laughs>